and welcome to another Best Junglers episode, this one for patch 13.10, the one where Riot really decided to have preseason. We have a whole bunch of new items, a lot of items got reworked, we also have changes to minions, trinkets, plants, to teleport, to turrets, I will be making a full breakdown on how to jungle in this new reality that will come very very soon, but in this video we will have a look at the best junglers for every single MMR that you can use to carry win and climb in this new meta. And as we also have an absolute huge itemization rework going on this patch, you need the best items and builds on these best junglers. And for that we have Mobilitics 2.0 itemization feature, designed to give you much more accurate data along with the meta, off meta and non meta build parts, as well as detailed descriptions on adaptive itemization, very important when they're going around changing every single item. Additionally, you can have a look at what the best in the world and one tricks are doing from Korea and any other region to observe how they figure out the new tech on their champions. All of this updated and pushed live to the companion app where you can put it directly into your client along with all of the pre-game tips, post-game tips as well as in-game tips such as itemization notification, level spike awareness, tips on how to play your champion, how to counter the enemy team composition. So if you want to dominate on the best junglers in the best way with all of the best information and keep up to date with all of the new itemization changes as the meta develops, click the link in the description below to download Mobilitics today. Even though the meta has had a shakeup, Kha'Zix is still the one who reigns supreme. A large reason for that is the new Ghostblade item. In fact, you will notice that common thread in this video, I hope. But the new stacking passive that gives you essentially movement speed also gives you a whole bunch of lethality. Which means when you combine it with your regular build, maybe you want to go Prowlers close second, maybe you're just an edge of night gamer, you will end up with a lot of that pseudo flat penetration. Not every champion will be able to use a new Prowlers call because now it is basically do you have that kind of dash in your kit versus let's press it and give you one. But those that do have it will get that bonus damage proc as well as an attack that slows for 99% for 0.5 seconds. So the combination of both those items is pretty spicy. Outside of that though, Kha'Zix just is inherently strong as well. Receiving unnecessary buffs the last time around and obviously two patches in a row has led to him becoming the absolute dominant force on the map. Now obviously I've seen people say I'm only going full glass assassin, evolve Q, evolve E, and then you've got other people retweeting and saying no I will never evolve Q, I'm not that dumb. Statistically you can still evolve Q first, just please don't do the pro play iteration of Kha'Zix, it is absolutely abysmally terrible. No one needs to rush Umbral Glaive and evolve W first. Likewise, Hecarim, even if he is technically not as strong as Rengar at the moment, is better for the general player base. Rengar is a bit more difficult to pick up, and obviously you only need Hooves IRL to actually pilot this champion. When you have the Ghostblade passive now, giving you passive movement speed procs, when you've got 100 stacks and you've got your E, you've got your Ghost, you've got your R, Hecarim's damage will really start to take over. The rest of his itemization has also basically stayed the same, and you have those same options. Trinity Force was buffed slightly, although we're not really seeing too much of that pickup just yet. The Blasting Cone delay from 5 minutes to 9 minutes doesn't really affect Hecarim as much when counter jungling and moving around the map because of our movement speed, although it is something worth noting. It does, however, mean champions who don't have map scaling that invade him and he catches them out of position, they can no longer escape. The added scaling to turret plates and the added shift to diving and the minion speed up, all of that means because there in theory should be less roaming and laning phase should be a bit more contained, it means that Hecarim can run absolutely batshit crazy around the map. Full sequencing and ganking, using his R in the predetermined lane, essentially enemy junglers who want to get in and get out of his jungle to compromise him, who don't have that ability to really elevate the game state by that 10, 11, 12 minute using that herald because of the plate shift, it gives him a bit more time to farm, get strong and carry games. And obviously Ghostblade. Next up we have Rangar who is absolutely, absolutely loving the Ghostblade shift as well. Moving in and out of bushes with your Gustwalker hatchling, movement speed passive, extra lethality, the snowballing is immense. Yeah, we kind of lose that on the crit Rangar with that infinity edge shift to mythic, but that doesn't really matter at this point because you can still pick up enough crit in your kit to have it still have presence. The Sheen and Essence Reaver combination with Lord Dominic's, that is still tried and true. We just have the added benefit of lethality from the mythic passive on Ghostblade. Thus Blade is seemingly not so strong, but remember with Rengar, if you can have a nice proactive early game, get that bone tooth stacking early, there's very little many champions can do against you right now. There's a brilliant fusion between meta and champion right now with these items. Obviously the Bloodthirst is something great that you can go as well with the absolute focus passive on it. Hey, more HP on you, more AD you have. Rengar says, oh, is that a triple Q combo for me? Nice. And if you reach that level 16, 17, 18 mark and get that Bloodthirst, and because of course we're running for a strike and everyone else is multiple levels below, well, that bonus AD damage is gonna be quite intense. Yes, with the Blasting Cone nerf and removal from five minutes and only bringing it out at nine minutes, we're going to lose a little bit of that maneuverability around the map circumventing vision, but any champion in his boat will. The difference is when you're trapped in a box with a Rengar, it usually doesn't go so well with you. Goes well for him, but not for you. And then we have Evelyn, who seemingly keeps getting indirectly buffed through itemization as well. Hey guys, we don't think Deathcap is good enough. Evelyn mains, really? You don't think it's good enough? 
We're going to buff it. Okay, buff it. That's fine with us. Also, they buff Lich Bane. So if you were that way inclined, I mean, there you go. Also, if you're feeling a little bit 2017 or 2018, you can go both Lich Bane and Death Cap. Regardless, they just gave Evelyn another indirect buff and she is just really enjoying this extended laning phase. You know why? Because we have Camouflage post sex. We can just run around and cheese people very, very easily between the turrets, in front of the turrets, around the turrets, in the rivers, wherever they might be. While you do want to get Evelyn into that mid-game phase, you want to do so ahead. If an enemy jungler is shutting you down, invading you, takes the first turret, takes all the plates, moves into your zone with her top laner or whatever, and now you can't farm against strong, that's what compromises her. Thanks to subsequent plates being increased in resistance, making that a little bit more difficult to achieve, Evelyn can now enjoy their prolonged laning phase for critical counter jungling and sequencing when she isn't exactly popping off. If you are popping off, then you will actually do more damage to turrets now with that shift to damage as well. Overall, a good meta for Evelyn. I'm sure they'll just buff Rocket Belt next patch for her for no reason. Next, we have Javid, who again is still very, very strong. And the direct benefit to him from this was simply the cost reduction in Gore Drinker, as well as the Mythic passive giving even more HP. Only good things. An extended laning phase is always good for Javid, but he did really thrive in activating that Herald, punching down the first turret, and really snowballing games very well. However, where he is really good is, of course, in those skirmishes and teamfights as we get later into the game, especially against assassins who might struggle around his copious amounts of tankiness and CC. Nevertheless, I wouldn't worry about it at all if you main Javan. This patch doesn't really affect you too much other than being aware of those shifts. You have map mobility, so the plant doesn't really concern you. Yeah, we have a scatter shift and things like that, and we need to gank a lot, but hey, two charges, six seconds apiece. If you've got two, you've got 12 seconds. Just pay very close attention to where vision is placed, and that six seconds is more than enough for most of the time. Now, if I told you to tell me how many one tricks in jungle are actually in high elo Korea while playing fiddlesticks compared to other junglers, you would absolutely be surprised. There are a lot of build variations, there are a lot of ways to play the champion in terms of how we think about using itemization spikes and angles, but the one thing that has always been true is that this champion is absolutely turbo strong. He is an eternal meta presence, people just refuse to learn the clear and become optimized at him, they refuse to learn the weird playstyle of the suck. But those who do, and again in an extended laning phase where turrets are falling down and you're being invaded, gives you more time to farm, more time to sequence, more time to yeet over walls and kill everybody, and yeah, even though they shifted the minion's focus on tower dives, do you really care about that? No, because you're gonna ult over fear everybody, they all die, you run away. Straightforward. Next up we have Kane, who might not actually like their prowless claw shift, but hey, you can still actually use the item at least. Ghostblade Rush is obviously phenomenal, and the Sterix Gate shift will be great for the Rusty Boys. And in both directions, hybrid form builds will shift a little bit, but largely remain the same. Charisma is testing out some stuff with Axiomark, so follow those builds if you're interested in that kind of spice. And again, another champion that doesn't mind too much the lack of mobility from the Blasting Cones. Overall, the champion is strong, the matchups are good, and if you want to climb to gold, Rust is the way to go. And finally, we have Echo, a little bit of a sleeper at the moment, but again, they buffed Deathcap. Echo likes Deathcap. Echo can use Death Cap. While atomization isn't as interesting when it comes to your AP champions, the Echo playstyle is of course very interesting. And remember, if we're expecting a longer laning phase with more ganks, that means you can have more counter ganks, and counter ganks are where we thrive, so get your tracking down, lay your Ws perfectly, control your vision with the new trinkets, pay attention to the fact that those minions are a lot faster, which means the next wave will come a lot faster than it used to, so those gaps in between are definitely not as big as before. Likewise, because you can 3 camp gank in a red side quadrant, that level 2, level 1 bottle main threshold with that second wave already joining in means that those ganks could be quite interesting for this champion. And on that note, we have Zac because Zac is one of those champions who people think, hey, spam ganker, low CSPM. No. If you look at the gameplay channel where we talked about this, you can very easily 7 to 8 CSPM with high KP just by using the farming jungler's mentality. And with them buffing certain aspects of his more supportive itemization, you can have a very affordable and effective 2-3 item spike. Whether that's you going for your Radiant Virtue stuff or your even Shroud tech. Next, we have the Eternal Gragas because he is still strong, still avoiding nerves, and basically, again, with the extended laning phase, he's going to be ganking a bit more. You don't want to AFK farm, you want to exert a lot of pressure. And again, with the map mobility and disruption he has, you should have no issue controlling those rivers very, very well and holding leads to take those turrets. And remember, for dives, because he has the casket, he can knock people out of turret range into him, body slam them, and just kill them. He doesn't have to actually walk under the turret like other pissed champions. I mean, he is pissed, but you know what I mean. Next up, we are going to talk about that valuable pick known as Graves. His win rate is not so good. His play rate is always good. However, let me introduce you to the Thalady Graves. I know some of you might have forgotten about it, but you can just go Ghostblade. You guys don't have to rush whatever the hell else you're rushing, because I look at the itemization win rates, and I'm thinking, 
Why aren't they just going Ghostblade? Yeah, so just go Ghostblade and you'll easily one shot people. You can one shot a Kha'Zix if you want. Now, while Nidalee is a very difficult champion, one of the most difficult in the game to play in the jungle, while she is inherently better in high elo, when a general player base win rate is this good, typically it means even if you're playing at 50% capacity, you can still be okay with that. And likewise, when we talk about the Hecarim and the Evelyn, having that extended laning phase to farm, and yeah, the Nidalee wants to elevate the game state and really shove an end, it does give her more time to trap you in the box and play with you like a cat would. And hey, 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 guess who's back? It's the Tree of Destiny, Maokai. Not Ivern, they're reworking and destroying him. I don't know what's going on there, but for Maokai, we have a bit of a resurgence. Why? When assassins are strong, they go on ADCs, and when it's an ADC-based meta, and you have tanks that can CC and peel the said assassin, you're seeing how it's all connected. Keep your ADCs and carries alive from the Kha'Zixes, from the Rengars, from the Evelyns, and uh, do your job. And basically, you'll win from that. Also, gank a lot. Following him, we are going to talk about the legendary Amumu. Just got those fresh buffs in the last patch round, made his jungle win rate go super high, as well as the support rate. The intent was not to make his jungle win rate go high, but everyone in the know said, this will make his jungle win rate go sky high. Guess what? It did. Guess what? It still is. Now we have two spicy picks coming up, and the first one is Talon. I'm sorry, I don't mean to remind you of the Ghost Blade, Gore Drinker, Talon meta season 11 hellscape, but yeah, more lethality, more movement speed passive proc. He's basically thriving in exactly the same way as anyone who can build this item. They will have to deal with it because it's just that damn strong. He is very difficult to play. Only the most skillful players are actually being able to have success with it lately, but now with this itemization shift and this meta shift about the map, Hey, you can too. Man, I love a good Karthus when you see one. It's very frustrating to be invaded, but if you're being invaded by four clearing Karthus with exhaust on your Grompa Blue, you didn't think about your pathing at all, and that's on you. The issue is, though, obviously, itemization spikes are very, very important for champions like this, and they just reduce the cost of last chapter. So now he has more time to farm. He can still ult from wherever he wants, and he gets his mana and last chapter power spike a lot sooner. Absolutely huge in games where he might not get that gank off, might not get that assist off, and he can go back and get that item a little bit faster. Always valuable when you can get itemization spikes sooner for scaling and snowballing champions. And so, Karthus rises. And you know what also rises? All of my low elo homies climbing through the depths of hell to get to gold. And with it, you are going to be using Amumu, Nocturne, Ramus, Jav, and Vi, Zack, Warwick, and Kane. Yes, you can in theory also use Kha'Zix, I'm just not putting it here because assassin play in this elo is very typically not so good. In the bronze as well as the silver course, I talk a lot about team fighting and positioning with your champions and maximizing your ability to carry the people in this elo range. Assassins, unless they're really overpowered, like a Kha'Zix, doesn't always give you the ease of use necessary. I'm not trying to say this to insult anybody, you can use an assassin to get to gold, go for it, but it's going to be much more difficult than playing one of these champions that just allows you to control the skirmishes, team fights in the jungle a lot easier. And if the enemy has an assassin, all of these champions will do very well against them. Also, you can gank an objective and sequence and lock down their carries really easily. And that's just such a powerful tool for this elo range to get up to that gold. And if you want to get up to that master plus and try some other stuff, hey, we can do that with Rengar because this one right here is absolutely batshit insane. Largely, mostly mains and one tricks that are inflating this and some people who are picking it up and realizing, hey, this is strong. Most players in this elo range are mechanically adept, which is why Nidalees and Rengars always have high win rates in Master Plus and lower win rates the further down you go. Yes, you can of course use Maokai, but the first six on this list here are absolutely the ones I'm seeing a lot of already. They have such high presence either through pick rate, ban rate, and win rate, all, all three. And interestingly, the Gragas is still there and the Kane is also showing up. Yes, you can go Maokai and Karthus, as I said. Talon is looking very sleep and nice for high elo as well, but if you're good on your champion and you got the high elo with it, you can still climb with it. These are just the ones with the highest presence and having the most influence, which means if your champion counters these and you understand what champions you should be banning or which ones you hate the most, that also structures how you play the game in this elo range, regardless of whether or not you're using these meta champions. And let us not forget the absolute power of Evelyn as well. Well, there you have it, the best junglers of a role for the new itemization mid-season, season 13 pre-season patch. And if you want to understand more about how team fightings actually work and how you can break it down and win it, no matter your champion, class, or rank, click the video in the box in the top right.